Welcome to the Part B Lecture Notebook for the second module, Python Basics, and the course Programming for Data Science. If you need help accessing this notebook, please see the instructions that are found in the description of this video on YouTube. In this lecture notebook, we have the following learning objectives. We are going to understand what a library is and what libraries are used for. Sometimes libraries are called packages, so I will often be using those terms interchangeably. We will also see how to load a Python library and use its functions as you become familiar with the dot convention. You will understand what the shape of a NumPy array means and how to create arrays of different shapes. You will also see how to cast the data type of a NumPy array, which is hearkening back to content that we saw in the Part A lecture notebook. In this notebook, other than this video, you have two primary activities and a summary activity, and then there's lots of other content to play with along the way. Some key points to keep in mind as we work through this notebook. A module is a single file of Python code that is meant to be imported. A package is a collection of Python modules under a common namespace. In computing, a namespace is a set of symbols that are used to organize objects of various kind so that these objects may be referred to by name. Now in practice, one is cr created, one being a package, by placing multiple Python modules in a directory with a special init dot pi module file with two underscores on the side of the init file name. Now, we won't be creating Python packages in this course, uh, but we will be dealing with Python packages, also called libraries, such as NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib, which are installed packages. Unlike many scripting languages, Python follows the conventions of many compiled languages by accessing packages, again, also called libraries, via the import statement. Three of the libraries you'll find yourself importing often are just what I said, NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib, and I provided links to all of the documentation to these packages for your reference here. There are several other libraries used commonly with Python when doing scientific computing, and the documentation at SciPy is a particularly useful starting point. We can import NumPy simply using the code import NumPy. This will import NumPy as NumPy. As we'll see later in this notebook, but I'll show it to you now, you could also write import NumPy as, and then you could give it a variable name. It's convention, you'll find this in a lot of other notebooks if you look at other materials online. It's convention to import NumPy as NP for NumPy, and we'll do that later, but for now, we'll just go ahead and import NumPy as NumPy. And you don't have to write import NumPy as NumPy. If you just import a library or package, whatever you want to call it, with that name, you then access it using that full name. So let's go ahead and import NumPy. So this first has to run, which takes a second because I had to connect to the runtime. I hadn't run a cell yet, so the runtime wasn't connected. And now NumPy is imported. Now to access a function or class in that library, the syntax is the library name, so in this case NumPy, dot the function name, and then any arguments that you would give that function. This is sometimes referred to as the dot convention because of this dot right here between the function name and the library name. This dot convention also applies to library constants. For example, floats that are commonly encountered when using a library such as pi or e. For example, in this code cell below, we show how to access both the sine function, the trigonometric sine function within NumPy, and evaluate it at pi, which is stored as a constant within the library. So here what we show you is that we can print numpy.pi, that this actually shows what the value of pi is as far as NumPy is concerned, the, the level of accuracy that it's stored in the library. And then we'll also look at what type of variable that is. So within numpy.py, we see that that is approximately 3.14159. Well, you know, you can keep seeing what those numbers are. And of course, that's a float. Now, if we take numpy.sign, this is accessing the trigonometric sine function within this library, and we're evaluating it at pi. Now, you should remember from trigonometry that sine of pi is zero. So what do we get when we print this? Well, we actually see that it's something that looks like 1.22 times 10 to the negative 16th. That's how you have to read this notation, this scientific notation, that this is approximately zero. This is essentially machine epsilon zero. 
And you say, why is this not exactly zero? Again, sine of pi is zero, but pi is an irrational number. It has a non-repeating, non-terminating decimal expansion. And remember what was talked about in the part A lecture notebook. When you're dealing with floating point uh, precision arithmetic, finite precision arithmetic, due to using floating point numbers on a computer, you're often gonna get approximate answers for certain evaluations instead of the exact answers that you might expect, even when you know exactly what the results are. For instance, that sine of pi is zero, because of course we're not even evaluating sine at exactly pi. We're evaluating it at some floating point approximation of pi. And then we're, you could even argue we're not even evaluating the real sine function, we're evaluating whatever the coded approximation of that sine function is. So that's what's going on here. But you can see it gives a pretty close result. I mean, we're with you know, 10 to the negative 16th is pretty close to zero. So that's just a little example of how to use the dot notation. In an interactive environment, like an IPython terminal or a Jupyter Notebook such as this, autocomplete features exist for imported objects. Now, how you access that autocomplete feature can vary slightly depending on how you're interacting with the notebook. For instance, in Colab, you don't have to press ta the tab key as you would in a more traditional Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab environment. You simply type the library name as it is imported. So we've imported NumPy just as NumPy. So we would have NumPy, and then we type the dot for that dot convention, and then you'll see, it just takes a second, you'll have all the autocomplete stuff will show up. I'm hoping this will show up in the video. Uh, what you can do is start typing a name, like uh, using some characters, like let's say I'm looking for something that starts with AR. And then if I do AR, it filters it to all the, the options I have that start with AR. Now, the one annoying thing that I see with Colab is that if I press the tab key, for instance, well, it, well that, that wasn't it. It does the autocomplete for whichever one I have selected as soon as I've kind of scrolled down to it. But if I happen to then press the tab key and it's not up, it doesn't do an autocomplete with that tab. And if you go back even to the dot, the autocomplete's not there anymore. You have to remove the dot and type it back in order to get the autocomplete options showing up again that you can then scroll through and then choose from, or again, start to type. Like if I do SI, because I saw there was sign, I can see all the other options I, I have within NumPy that have an SI in them. So there's the sign, the sign bit, there's the trigonometric sign, a sync function, the hyperbolic sign function. So again, I hope all these are showing up in the video, but this is what you need to do in order to access it in Google Colab. So again, if I had like the space by accident, then I go back, I hit the back key, it's just gone, the autocomplete's not there. I have to go all the way back to remove the dot, type the dot again, or period, whatever you wanna call it, in order to get that autocomplete back. We can use the from and import statements with a library in order to import very specific functions or subpackages from that library without having to import the larger library. This can make our code more efficient. The example here is only meant to show how to combine multiple imported functions and subpackages. It is not meant to be the way you should generate a random normal uh, number. But what we do is from the large math package, we import the log function. This is the logarithm function, the natural log function. We then import just the random subpackage from NumPy. Now we've already imported NumPy in here, so we wouldn't necessarily have to do this. This is just to show you how you would do it. For instance, if this was the first code cell you were working on and you just happen to want to generate a normal random sample by taking the logarithm of a log normal random sample. So when we import log from math and we import random from NumPy, we can then use the dot convention because random is a sub package within NumPy to access the log normal uh, function within the random sub package. This will generate a single log normal uh, random variable. And then by taking the logarithm of it, it then becomes a normal random sample. And then of course we can just print that sample. 
This also gives you the idea of some stochasticity, some randomness that you can impart into your code, especially if you want to have some sort of random number generator. That happens a lot in the stuff that I do in my research and also in some other courses that I teach that I want to have some random variations in the inputs and outputs of code. And so if I rerun this code cell, what will happen every time? It won't actually re-import these. Uh, the, because one of the things that Python's really um, smart about is it sees if something's already imported, it doesn't go through the effort of re-importing it. Of course, that's kind of a problem if you edit a module you're importing, but we'll talk about that in a future lecture. But for now, we can just rerun this code cell and all that will happen is it will rerun, it will re-execute these three lines of code right here, lines five, seven, and eight, because line six is blank. But because it's a random number generator, you should see that this output should change. And in fact, it's unlikely you'll see any of these numbers when you run it and follow along because you'll have a different random seed, a, a different starting point in the random number generator when you're running the code. So in fact, if I restarted my runtime and I cleared outputs and I reran this, I would see completely different numbers. You should try that for yourself and verify that that is the case. So I'll just run it one more time. There you go. Different numbers every time. Here I go over the instructor-led activity on practice with using imported functions. What we're asked to do are three things. Fill in the missing pieces of the code cells to import the normal function from the sub package uh, random of NumPy. So you access it through the dot notation. Random of NumPy allows you to access the library. We want to import that sub library, that sub package random as our norm. Now, after we've done that, which is supposed to be done in this first code cell, in the second code cell, we need to print a single normally distributed random number with mean zero and standard deviation one, and also print a single normally distributed random number with mean five and standard deviation 0 0.1. I also provide a link to the documentation here, and I recommend that you actually pause the video now, read through that documentation, and try to do this activity on your own before you continue with the video to watch me solve it. Okay. Let's first take a look at this documentation. Now you see that the normal function within the random sub package, so here I'm assuming, based on the way the documentation is written, that you've imported numpy.random as random. So then you have random.normal to access the normal function, and it takes three parameters, loc, short for location, scale, and size. And you see that there's some default values for each of these, zero, one, and none. And you need to understand, well, what do these parameters mean? Well, if you scroll down a little, you'll see that the loc function, uh, parameter excuse me, is the mean or center of the distribution. So that's what we want to change the value of when we want to use a different mean. Scale is the standard deviation, and that's something that we also want to change if we want to change the standard deviation. And then size is something that we change from none, because uh, if it's none, a single value is produced, we would only change it to an integer or a tuple of integers if we wanted to output different numbers or shapes of numbers of these randomly generated normal outputs. And it will get a scale or a single output if we have the none for the size. Otherwise, if we give an int or a tuple of ints, we will get an ND array, which is just short for like a NumPy array. That's a NumPy array uh, type right there. There's also some examples that are here that are worth looking at. So you can draw samples from the distribution with a mean and a standard deviation. Notice they have 0 and 0 0.1 here, and that they also don't have the proper two spaces on the comment uh, there. But they do have that, by the way, on these outputs. And they do say, hey, these outputs may vary. And of course, they'll vary because you're going to have randomly generated outputs. And here you see that they're generating 1,000 samples. And because they're samples, they're calling it S. All right, so that's the instructions for this activity and the documentation. We now actually solve this activity. So the first thing again is we want to import the NumPy random um, function. We, we want to import, excuse me, the normal function as our norm. So from, from NumPy.random, we want to import uh, normal and we want to import it as our norm. I'll just make sure I have the two spaces there for proper uh, kind of commenting etiquette. And now we will, this will import the normal function as our norm. We don't have to import the entire random sub package of NumPy in order to do this. We just import the normal function as our norm. So now I run that, it's executed. 
Now we're going to try this. There's a code comment. We're going to rerun this code cell multiple times, but you'll see that again, there's these red underlines. There's these red uh, vertical lines here. This is in a collab setting, indicating that there's likely some errors at lines four and at lines 10. And you'll see, of course, if I try to run this, I get some errors and I have an invalid syntax because I haven't made location equal to anything. I just set it up so that it was pretty obvious what you wanted to do. Location should be equal to 0.0 because .0 that's the mean and the scale here should be 1.0. And then here the location should be uh, 5.0 and the standard deviation should be 0.1. So that fixes all the errors. We run it and you can see here's the output. Here's a sample with a mean zero scale one. And you see it's negative 0.288. And this one is 5.13. And now if we rerun this a few times, so I can rerun uh, over and over again. So I'm just pressing control enter on my keyboard so I can run but not move on. You see here this other random number uh, and this other one, right? So we have negative 0 0.0035 and 4.9. So, right, the first numbers that are printed are gonna be closer to zero because that's the mean of that distribution. And these ones will be closer to five. And if you run this several times, so I'm gonna do control enter again, control enter again. Like here, you notice this one's almost one, but we're not moving too far away from five here. Well, the standard deviation here is much smaller than this. So when the standard deviation, excuse me, the standard deviation, I'll try to talk a little slower. When the standard deviation is smaller, um, you have less spread of your random samples. So when it's larger, you have more spread. So we're allowing more variation around the mean in this first one than in the second one. You can go ahead, if you like, you can play with the, uh, what, what was it, the size uh, one? Let me just go ahead and look. I believe it, you can just give a number there, but it was the size. I'm just keywording everything. So size, and if I made, let's say 10 right here, you can just see what would happen. Now I have this array of outputs and I can have a different size here. I can have this one be, let's say like 50. And you can see I generated 50 normal random numbers uh, with mean five and standard deviation 0 0.1. And you can kind of compare the spreads of these. You can definitely see some numbers here, like this is almost, for instance, two away. Your results will differ from the mean, whereas you don't get too much of a spread. Like the largest one I'm spotting here, I'm probably gonna get it wrong in the video and I circle it, but I see one that's about 4.72, so it's almost 0.3 away, which is not as far as, uh, well, as this, right, where we see several numbers that are more than one unit away. But again, we had a standard deviation of one here and we had a standard deviation of 0 0.1, an order of magnitude less on this one. So that's it. That's all there is to this instructor led activity. And that should help you hopefully solve the first activity on your own. We can also import a library and assign it a convenient nickname. In fact, this is how we typically do things. Here I'm showing how you can import NumPy as NP, which is the most common way that you'll find people import NumPy. That way it's just shorter to use the dot convention so that you can access, for instance, the logarithm function. And that, by the way, is the natural log. You might call it uh, LN, but you can import that, use, or use that, I should say, using NP uh, dot log. And then you can take the log of E, and this is a NumPy constant, NP dot E. And that's, of course, something that's approximating Euler's constant. That should, of course, be one. I've already run this code cell, and you can see now I have NumPy imported as NP. And we have this output of one. Now, if you look at imported lump, uh, libraries, they show up as a variable with type module. You can run the following code cell to see this. This is using that magic whose command. So if I run that, there we go. I have NP imported as a module, also NumPy. So there's a bit of a name collision. Well, it's not actually a name collision, but I've imported the same library twice. I've just imported it as different variables, once as NumPy and once as NP. So that was very unnecessary. And it's good to see that because you might point to some inefficiencies in your notebook or your code when you look at the variables. You can also see this again if you go to this variables command up here in the left entry. And then actually here we see this, oh, there's the sample size. But you know, it's interesting. I thought it might actually show what these uh, variables are, but it's, um, excuse me, these libraries, but it's not. So I was expecting that to be the case, but in fact, it is not. So the whose command is actually their superior compared to that variables command. It actually shows the modules and other things like we've imported our norm, for instance. Remember, that was from the instructor led activity where we imported the normal function from the random sub package of NumPy. And that's showing up here, but again, it's not showing up in these variables over here. So that's very important to know the distinction between whose and that variables. Now there's a cautionary note on importing, and you should really read this note. I'm serious about that. 
it is possible to avoid typing the library name or nickname altogether by just importing everything with an asterisk as a star. We often say star. So you could import NumPy as star, and this will just dump everything of NumPy into your namespace, meaning kind of this, this space where you have all your variables defined and everything. This loads every sub package and function within the NumPy li library into the current namespace. You can do this. You should not do this. This is strongly discouraged because one, it provides the opportunity for namespace collisions. For instance, imagine you already had a variable named pi prior to the import of NumPy. What happens with that pi constant or that e constant if you had e defined elsewhere? So it can create a lot of conflicts that you don't want, that you don't necessarily even foresee happening, but they could happen. Also, it may be inefficient. Well, very likely to be inefficient. The number of objects imported is big. Also, this does not explicitly document the origin of the variable method or class, which provides a type of auto documentation in the program that makes it easier for others to know what you are doing. So if you just start using like the log function, it's like, well, is this the log function or absolute value function that's in Python natively? Is it, is it NumPy? Is like what got replaced? What's being used? It's unclear when somebody reads the code. But if somebody's looking at this code, for instance, up here, they can see exactly, oh, this is the logarithmic function of NumPy. This is the constant E for NumPy. It's not just you know E or log where it's not clear what that's coming from, which is what would happen if I imported NumPy as star. So do not do that. So again, some key points. Um, importing any library as star is strongly discouraged. You can provide namespace collisions, it can be inefficient, and it makes it harder to debug and understand what the code is doing. We now discuss NumPy arrays and why these are more efficient than lists in scientific computing. So NumPy arrays are more efficient than lists of numbers because they're designed without the flexibility of lists in mind. They're designed in mind with having specific data types that are the constant, the same type of data type across the entire NumPy array. They're more convenient to use when we need to perform operations from numerical linear algebra. And in fact, much of computational science and really data science boils down to numerical linear algebra. And what do we mean by convenient? Well, you get a lot of vector and matrix operations for free, meaning that we can often avoid unnecessary work that would be required if we were to just use lists, like having to define our own functions to carry out the operations we want. For instance, we saw that if you multiply a list by, a con uh, by an integer, you end up just creating kind of like a longer list that shows copies of the list contents over and over instead of multiplying the number to the components of the list. In order to do that with a list, you'd have to write your own function, and it's gonna be more ineffective it's going to be more inefficient than just using a NumPy array and just multiplying a vector matrix, an array of numbers in NumPy by a number, a scalar, which would then just multiply every component in that object by that number. So do lists have any advantages? Well, yes, they are more flexible. They can handle multiple data types in a way that NumPy cannot. But again, that flexibility comes with a heavy price in terms of memory usage and not being able to apply a lot of built-in functionality on the list. NumPy arrays are typically one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or three-dimensional. This is determined by the use of a certain number of square brackets, and we see some examples of this below. A particular entry in an array is commonly referred to as a component of the array. A 1D array has a shape of the form n and then comma, so n denotes the number of components in the array. This is a 1D array. A 2D array has the shape of the form n comma m. Now, if m is one, you might think, oh, that's the same thing as a 1D array. No, it is not. A 1D array is n comma nothing. There's no number there, not a zero, not a one, nothing. It's n comma nothing. If you ask for the shape, you'll see something like this with a number for n that denotes number of components. The 2D array is of the form nm. So it's the number of rows and the number of columns are n and m respectively. Then a 3D array has a shape of the form KNM, and it's often best conceptualized as K different 2D arrays of shape N by M. So we make heavy use of NumPy arrays, and below are some examples of array constructions, and you want to pay attention to the number and location of the square brackets used to define the input, uh, excuse me, the dimensional inputs of the arrays. We now look at some examples of NumPy arrays. We see a 
1D array, a 2D array, and a 3D array. Now a 1D array is typically called a vector. A 2D array is sometimes called a matrix. And a 3D array, we just call a 3D array. Now you'll notice, I'm just highlighting things and the way I've in introduced some white spaces, is there's only one pair of square brackets. When you put your cursor to the right or left of a, of a square bracket, you're met with its pair, it's shown kind of visually, it's outlined um, on the screen. So see the 1D array of one, two, three, four has four components, so it should be of shape four comma, which is something we'll see in just a bit. And it just has th those components in one array. Now the 2D array, you see that there's two kind of collections of square brackets. There's this outer set of brackets and then this inner set of brackets around the different components. So we have one, two as one of the arrays, a 1D array in the 2D array. We see another 1D array is three, four and another 1D array is five, six. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, but the one, two, three, four, and five, six are grouped by those square brackets. Now in the 3D array, we see three pairs basically of, of square brackets, but notice I said that a 3D array, if you might recall, has a shape of the form K and M, so it's best conceptualized as K different uh, N by M arrays. So we see that we're gonna have an actual, like a two by three um, array in here. So here's our first 2D array, because there's two square brackets. There's kind of this outer one here, and then these two sets of inner ones that are showing the 1D arrays that are gonna make up the rows of this uh, first uh, 2D array that is in this 3D array, because the 3D array is, has a couple of these 2D arrays in it. And we see it's one, two, three, four, five, six as the two rows. So it should be a two by three array. That's the first one. The second two by three array is seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And again, you see here's the outer bracket. And let me just go here. There's the outer bracket you see here and here. And then we have these inner arrays, the 1D arrays. And then we close that, that's our 2D array. And then we close our 3D array there. And now we're just gonna print these outputs. And so now you'll see them, uh, you'll print some of them. And I'm again showing some of these things. Like, so here I'm just gonna print the 1D array, the 2D array. And here, remember Python indexing starts at zero. I'm going to print the second 2D array that is in the 3D array. Cause the 3D array again has two 3D array, excuse me, <laughs> has a couple of 2D arrays inside of it the way that I've defined it above. All right, so I'm just gonna print that now. So you see the 1D array is printed as if it's a row. So it's a one, two, three, four. The 2D array, you actually see the square brackets here. So there's the two sets of square brackets and it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can look up here again, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't matter that we have these going left to right, the commas, and the square brackets are interpreted as the proper separation of these. So you're inputting everything a row at a time. First row, second row, third row. And you see it here, first row, second row, third row, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then the second 2D array in our, see here's our array shape with the, you can actually just see it on the screen, hopefully this pop up shown in the video. It's two by two by three, meaning it has two two by three arrays in it. And we see that the second one, because again, Python indexing starts at zero, I'm gonna repeat that a few times, is that seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and you can see the pairs, right, of the of these square brackets. So we have the outer ones, and then we of course have the inner ones. Now, I definitely recommend that you play around with this. Insert your own code cells or scratch cells, but I think your own code cells are a great idea. You can insert it right down here and you can look at the full 3D array. You could look at just, if you change this to a zero, do that in your own code cells, really experiment a little bit, play around with this, change the components, make arrays of your own shape and size. I highly recommend you play around with this on your own to get some better understanding. Now, I do wanna point out before I end this part of the video, that once a NumPy array is defined, we can investigate many of its attributes easily. So here I'm showing how you can access through that dot convention, the shape attribute of an array, and I'm gonna show it for the uh, 1D, 2D, and 3D arrays. And there's also a size attribute. So these are just data attributes. So the way that you uh, print them out, so let's go ahead and print them is just like that. You just do dot shape. So data attributes are just accessed with dot and then the data attribute name. And so we see that the shape of the 1D array is four comma, right? There's no other number there. The shape of the 2D array is three, two. 
and the shape of the 3D ray is 223. Now, of course, we can see by hovering our cursor over these things, similar information given, but a lot of times when you're running code, you'd like to have that printed if there's lots of arrays so you can visually inspect it, because it takes time to take your cursor and find every variable you're interested in, hover your cursor over it and see that information. And you're not always going to be working in an interactive environment, so you often want to just be able to print these, this information to the screen. It's really helpful for debugging. So here's a different 3D array before we end this portion of the video. So notice the what's going on here. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And you say, oh, those are the same numbers that were appearing here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But notice we went 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6. We had two rows because you're inputting this a row at a time with a comma separating it. We have that comma separating, which is that another space there, the 2D arrays. So let's look at the, what's going on with this different one. We put, um, oops, there we go. I'll just kind of zoom in. Here's that one, two, three, four, five, six, but they're separated now into uh, three rows of two numbers each. And similarly with the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So if we print that entire array and we actually look at its shape, now this different 3D array, we see that here's how a 3D array is printed as collections of 2D arrays with a space between each 2D array. And now they're three by two arrays. So it's like two cop, two not copies, I should say, because they're different. It's two three by two arrays. That's a good way to think of the 3D array. So that's it for this part of the video. And then I have an instructor led activity in the next part. We will be creating arrays of different shapes. We will fill in the code cells below to create a 2D array of shape 4x2 and a 3D array of shape 2x4x2. So that is, again, best thought of as two different 4x2 arrays. So in the uh, first array, this is the 2D array, we want to just create, create an array of shape uh, 4x2. So it's a 2D array. So let's just go ahead and get two sets. I'm just going to go ahead and zoom in here. We'll get two sets of brackets started just so that we know that it's, it's a 2D array. Put some spaces, that's the way I usually like to do it. And now what I want when it's a four by two is I want four rows with two columns. So I can just, it doesn't really matter what you put in here number wise, but I can put one and two, I can put three and four, I'll just count up five, five and six, five and six, and then I will put in uh, seven and eight. And so now if I look at that array, if I run it, you'll see that it is a four by two array and it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight as the four rows respectively. So you can play around with this as well. You can create more code cells, just keep adding more arrays. You could change instructions here if you like, that's up to you. Now for the 3D array, this uh, is this two different four by two arrays. I basically want this twice. So an easy way for me to do this, just because I'm trying to complete this activity is I can copy these contents into here, into my array 3D here. And now this would be the first 3D or first 2D array. So let me just go ahead and make a second set. So I'm just going to kind of zoom in here so you can see it. I ha now have three different square brackets. So the, this inner pair that involves these two, this is my first 2D array. So now if I put a comma right there and I was to, let's say, put those same contents and this is a good place because it's getting kind of long. So just press enter the return key and I can just put these things again here, just put a little space there. So now I have my two arrays, my two four by two arrays. And you can go ahead and change these numbers. Um, one thing I wanna show you, cause we're about to talk about data types. So this is a um, good place to do it, is I'm gonna go ahead and make this 1.0 right there. Cause I just want you to see what happens to this array when I do that. Notice how all the entries have a point now right there. They're all of data type float. So remember I, I said this before that NumPy arrays want to create an array where all the data types are the same within the array, which is different than a list, which can have different types of data types in the list. So as soon as I have a float in here, all of these need to be floats in order for NumPy to be able to store this. Whereas up here, they were all of int type. So even though that has nothing to do with this activity, it does have something to do with what we will see next. But the main point, as far as completing this activity, is we do see that we have a two by four by two. So two four by two arrays are making up that 3D array, which is what we were asked to do. And that completes that activity.
continuing along the lines of what we were just discussing in that instructor-led activity, we're going to now talk about the casting of the data type of a NumPy array. So the NumPy data type attribute, dtype, dtype for data type, describes the type of data stored in a NumPy array. And it is cast as the minimal data type required to store all the data. So we were just seeing this in that example. Um, but it's a little bit more apparent here with the dtype attribute. So let's look at this. Here in this code cell, we look at the dtype attribute and we look at it for the array 3D. So just uh, to kind of come back up here, because I believe I need to rerun the, the cell since I've restarted this. So let's just go ahead and do it right here. Array 3D, make sure that's run. Okay, so there's our array 3D, so I know it's loaded. And if I come down here, oops, almost done. There we go. And I look at the data type. You will see, right, I'm printing the type of a NumPy array is the minimal type required to hold all the data. And the data type of the original array 3D is int 64, meaning it's in, they're all integers. And it's just the 64 just has to do with something involving the number of bytes that it's storing in. But the point is this, they're integers, INT, they're integers. And just like in the instructor activity, when I showed how I could add a, you know, a period, like a point zero to something, this will create an array uh, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. These are um, two 4 by 3 arrays. This will now make all the data floats. And if I look at the data type, so let's just go ahead and run this. We see again that 1 period, 2 period. That's because it's really like 1.0. And you see now they're all float 64. And again, the float is what's important as far as you're concerned, probably. The 64 is again just related to something in memory storage. No, I just want to point out, this is kind of the very last thing we're going to do before the summary activity that you have to do on your own. You can recast data in NumPy arrays as different data types using the special as type function. This creates a copy of the specified array that are cast to a specific specified type. So as, a, as an example, that 2D array, we can cast it as type float. Now this is not changing what the array 2D is. It's still an integer array, as you will see. And we can also you know, cast it as a string type. So this is kind of like what we saw in our first lecture in module two. Let's go ahead and run it. So you see what I'm printing first is this output is printed here. And you see by casting it as a float, it looks like this one period, two period, three period, four period, five period, six period. That's the 1.0, 2.0. It's just a shorthand. It doesn't need to show the zero. If, if, if it's a zero, it just does one point, two point but it really means 1.0. But it didn't change the actual contents of the array, which is still of type integer, which we see right here. And then here it is as a string, let me just click there, and you can see it just put some tick marks around all of those, and that was ca casting it as a string in this particular you know, usage of it, but it still left the contents as a NumPy array of int type. You can also specify the data type during the array creation call. So for instance, if I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and then 12.0, but then when I'm creating it, I say as type int, I'm now storing that as array 3D. And now these will all be integer types, is what you will notice from here. They're all integer types and it's integers. So that's just a little bit about casting. I again encourage you, create your own code cells. Add markdown text, explain and explore for yourself what's going on, and just mess around with it. It's a good thing to play with. And that's the end of the uh, Part B lecture notebook. Thanks for listening.